Hello everybody, the time has come where I'm finally going to speak to you about the remains of the day and discuss some points in this book a little bit. Um, sorry it's taken me so long. I realized it was a little bit harder to analyze than I thought, but here we go, we're going to try. Um, just a reminder that I've never really run a book club before or I don't really know what is expected of me from this point on. So I'm just going to go with it raise a couple points that I think are worth talking about and if you have any comments you can just write below I don't know if you've read it um, I know a couple people have said that they were trying to get it from the library so definitely don't watch this video if you haven't read the book or you're interested in still reading the book because we're gonna give away uh, secrets and details here so just a pre-warning about that so diving right in here um, the book is clearly about Stevens the butler the aging English butler and he lives in Lord Darlington's manor with um, his father and then this housekeeper, Miss Kenton. And one thing that I really noticed um, was his relationship with his father. Now his father was a really dignified butler and Stevens obviously wanted to model and be like him in that sense. And one thing that I enjoyed reading throughout the book was um, observing his father's aging and his, I guess, memory loss a little bit and um, just how the service, his service was failing because his father was aging and he couldn't perform the um, standards that Stephen C Stevens Jr. was used to. So um, Stephen Sr. would misplace items. I think he dropped a couple things and broke them. Um, he was seen kind of wandering around the gardens um, trying to look at the land and look at the steps to see how he could have tripped that one time when he fell. So he's just kind of, not going see now, but just slowly aging and can't keep up with his work. And instead of kind of sympathizing or empathizing with his father, um, Stevens Jr., the main character of the book, um, gets sort of short with his father because to him, being a butler, you know, it, he thinks it's just something that will come always naturally. And, you know, now that his father is aging, he's having a hard time coming to terms with his service um, failing as well. So his health and his service is now failing. So something that's interesting is the stress that um, Stephen's father is having on the household. So Miss Kenton, she's the head housemaid. Um, for those, this butler does like the serving and the house service does more of the cleaning. So, Miss Miss Kenton, when, you know, something is out of place or, you know, Stephen's father does something wrong, she wants to point it out. So, you know, Stephen's knows and because she loves service too and she wants to um, do a good job um, serving Lord Darlington and, you know, upkeeping his household. So, she'll point out the error and Stephen's kind of gets agitated by this because... You know, for one, you know, his father, he's very proud of his father. He's very proud of his father's work, the same work that he now does. Um, so he feels kind of, you know, upset that she would, you know, contradict this because he was a well-known butler um, in his time. And so she, you know, their relationship is strained because their father is this common um, sort of, you know, cause for headbutting and tension within their relationship. So when Stephen's father finally does pass on, um, you can see the shift in Stevens and K Miss Kenton's relationship, um, how they can communicate more and they can, you know, there's nothing, there's no awkwardness because, you know, Stephen's father almost presented like just this awkwardness that prevented their relationship from going forward. Um, but after he's passed on, which was the most heartbreaking moment in the book, well, that was the first most heartbreaking moment. And then obviously there is the last moment, which I'm sure... It made you shed a tear a little bit too because every time I read that part, this is the second time I've read the book now, it just gives me this like lurch in my heart and I just want to cry. Anyway, just Stephen's father's death. Uh, what can I even say about that? How he's so morally, all his morals are in his work. Being a butler and giving good service. And during such a pivotal point in Lord Darlington's um, career essentially, so Lord Darlington, the owner of the house, has all his guests over and they're expect they're waiting, Stephen's waiting on them. They need Stephen, they're trying to keep him around. And at this very same time, um, Stephen's father is dying up in his bedroom. And Miss Kenton's trying to, to bring him away and say, you know, you need to go see your father now. And Stephen's is hesitant to leave the party and leave where his service in, is needed. Um, so 
how that plays out is just... It's funny because, you know, you want to think Stevens as kind of a cold man and who, you know, it's like, well, why wouldn't he put his father first? I don't understand. Like, this is... Like, you don't ignore someone's death. You want to be there for them, especially your own father. But at the same time, it's like both of them understood that the service would come first and your dignity lies within your job as a butler and not with emotional problems outside of your work, you know? Like, family life is family life off hours, but then when you're a butler, that is where you need to be. So seeing that last, you know, last interaction between them was quite fascinating. What else do I have here? I wrote down a couple notes so I wouldn't forget. Um, I just thought it was interesting. In my edition, it's page 130. I don't know if that means anything to you. But it um, brings it back to present day. Because a lot of the book is him remembering and reminiscing days long ago, you know, about his father's death, about Miss Kenton. But in present day, he's on a trip to go visit Miss Kenton. Um, or her, as you know, she's now married. She's not Miss Kenton, she's Mrs. something else, I forget. So... During his travels to go see her, he stops off at an inn, and everybody at the inn is um, joking around with him. They think he's like a really distinguished person, which I guess um, a butler was back in the day. Wow, my hair is funky today. So, one thing I thought was interesting was that he was, for one time, he was the center of attention, and everybody there at that dinner table wanted him. To listen to him and see what he had to say um while at lord darlington's obviously he was always in the shadows and not part of the conversation of the dinner guests um occasionally um the get dinner guests would heckle him and you know try to get him to share his opinions on large world matters that he obviously wouldn't know much about and i think that is part of the reason why he was so internal and internalized everything and couldn't share his feelings with Miss Kenton or um, with anybody because the chances that he did get to speak, it's like, okay, you're having a conversation with your employer and he's not speaking down to you, but you are his servant and you have to be humble towards him. And so in the moments where um, Lord Darlington's guests were sort of heckling him and being like, so what do you think about this issue? And you know, he has to compose himself put together, you know, um, some kind of words. Usually he won't share an opinion. He will either, um, you know, agree with what someone else has said. But um, in this one part in this tavern, um, he says, As I spoke, I was struck by the thought, the same thought that had struck me on numerous occasions in late of late in Mr. Faraday's presidents, that some sort of witty retort was required of me. Indeed, the local people were now observing a polite silence, awaiting my next remark. I thus searched my imagination and eventually declared. And declared whatever he said. And then later on he goes to say, I had, ra I had been rather pleased with my witticism when it had first come into my head, and I must confess I was slightly disappointed it had not been better received than it was. I was particularly disappointed, I suppose, because I had been devoting some time and effort over recent months to improving my skills in this area. That is to say, I've been endeavouring to add this skill to my professional armory so as to fulfil with confidence all Mr. Faraday's expectations with respect to bantering. Um, so Mr. Faraday is Stephen's new employer and will ask more opinions of Stephen's and will care more to hear what he has to say. Whereas his former employer, Lord Darlington, um, Stephen's took much more on the servant role. As, uh, Lord Darlington was his master and not really, um, you know, speak when you're spoken to sort of thing. Um, so that's funny just how his confidence sort of changes in that situation. It was like a rare glimpse into Stephen's um, persona. It, like his personality, deep inside his personality was kind of, you know, coming through. Whereas as a butler, him responding, it would be way more subdued. And he, you couldn't, you like, he has no true opinions. He can't form a thought and or opinion that's his own because that would be kind of contradicting his master, if you know what I mean. As, as I had mentioned, um, Stevens and Miss Kenton's relationship changes after his father dies. And one of those um, changes, and it's funny how the author, um, Kazuo Ishiguro, only hints at what this really means, but basically he talks about how at the end of the day, um, Miss Kenton and Stevens will have cocoa together in the evening and discuss 
the day's work essentially, but you know, it suggests, and there's some written about how it's more than just that. And, uh, you know, how they'll be actually essentially on a date, um, you know, over cocoa. So that's kind of funny. Um, so then moving on, another, um, part of the book that really delves into Stephen's true personality and not his serving persona, um, you should count how many times I say serving during this video, but is on page, in my edition of course, page 167, and I'm sure you remember it if you remember this section, was when, um, Miss Kenton finds a book and teasingly wants it from Stephen and wants to see what he's reading and he gets all shy and he's like no give me the book she's like what is it you must be hiding something like what kind of book are you reading here and makes it into this big kerfuffle um and then she finally gets it and she says good gracious Mr. Stevens it isn't anything so scandalous at all simply a sentimental love story and he gets all flustered and kind of sends her out of the room and you know that's that but Later it on, and it's his narrative, he's saying, he's making an excuse for this sentimental love story. He's saying that, you know, it's simply a book that Lord Darlington had in one of the guest rooms and that it's a perfect way for him to master the Eng English language because he's learning new words and, and dialogue and stuff. That's just funny to me because it shows that deep down he is a sentimental man. He would love to have his own love story and he's reading about such a love story. But even to us, as he's narrating the story, even to us, the reader, he's making excuses for it, saying he's strictly reading it for la learning the English language. And, of course, we're not even Miss Kenton, the person who's he's trying to gain affection. So um, that was an interesting section. So finally, even at the end of the book, so he's going to see Miss Kenton. She's been married now. She has a daughter. Um, life has changed dramatically, and he's getting they're getting pretty much older, very old in age. Um... And he's still beating around the bush with her. And she says, she just has to say it flat out. Like, finally, she wasn't having any of his shenanigans anymore, she says. Um, and on my edition, this is page 239. And you get to thinking about a different life, a better life you may have had. For instance, I get to thinking about a life I may have had with you, Mr. Stevens. And I suppose that's when I get angry over some trivial little thing and leave. But each time I do so, I realize before long, my rightful place is with my husband. After all, there's no turning back the clock now, and one can't be forever dwelling on what might have been. One should realize one has as good as most, perhaps better, and be grateful. And Stevens goes on. I do not think I responded immediately, for it took me a moment or two to fully digest these words of Miss Kenton. Moreover, as you might appreciate, their implications were such as to provoke a certain degree of sorrow within me. Indeed, why should I not admit it? At that moment, my heart was breaking. Before long, however, I turned to her and said with a smile, You're very correct, Mrs. Ben, and as you say, it's too late to turn back the clock. Indeed, I would not be able to rest if I had thought such ideas were the cause of unhappiness for you and your husband. We must, each of us, as you point out, be grateful for what we do have. And from what you tell me, Mrs. Ben, you have, re you have reason to be content contented. And then, towards the end of the book, page 244. I should cease looking back so much that I should adopt a more positive outlook and try to make the best of what remains of my day. After all, what can we ever gain in forever looking back and blaming ourselves if we had, if our lives have not turned out quite as we might have wished? Skipping a bit, what is the point in worrying oneself too much about what one could or could not have done to control the course one's life took? And if some of us are prepared to sacrifice much in life in order to pursue such aspirations, surely that is, in itself, whatever the outcome could cause for pride and contentment. So, this is near, like, the last, second to last page of the book. And you can see that, although, you know, he could have had a mischance with Miss Kenton, and his heart was breaking thinking about it, and she had admitted that she wished she had had it. He rationalizes and justifies it, just as he always has done, and internalizes those last feelings um, and says, I might as well, you know, make best of what I have left in the remains of my day. So that is my um, detailed synopsis of this book. Very interesting character Stevens is. And I think, as I said in the first video, um, you know, I can relate a lot to that in internalizing feelings and, you know, woulda, shoulda, coulda. And one thing I admire about Stevens, while I would never want to 
you know, ignore love when it's at my doorstep, and I obviously haven't, but one thing that you can admire about Stevens is him, you know, moving on with life and trying to stay content even though he knows he has made a mistake. And at the end he admits, he actually finally admits that he had made a mistake and but now, you know, he's made his bed essentially and he's gonna lie in it and he's gonna enjoy those last moments of his life. So very interesting book. Um, let me know what you thought about it definitely down below and uh, I'd be interested to hear your feedback or your thoughts or other discussion points that you think we should bring up. So that concludes the um, book talk discussion. I've read a couple books in the meantime um, that I would be happy to talk about next or if someone else wanted to um, talk about one of the books they've read, uh, maybe we could all try to read them. I might as well just suggest um, my next picks. They would either be So if you did want me to do another book talk discussion, now I would be doing this um, this filming a lot more recently because I've finished these books already and I'm not in the process of reading them. Um, this one's set in Nova Scotia in Canada and this one's set in Toronto. So if you're interested in either of these, I will probably be doing a video about them. And if you want us to read one of your books, let me know and we will pass that torch off and um, put the book club in a different direction and be more timely on my videos, not three months later. Um, so definitely that is it, and I really appreciate you all um, watching and participating if you are, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, bye.